Welcome to The Creative Influencer, where we discuss all things creative with an emphasis on influencers. The Creative Influencer is hosted by John Pfeiffer. John is an entertainment attorney in Santa Monica, California, who represents influencers and other creatives. This is episode 12 of the second season of the Creative Influencer Podcast. Today, we interview Travis Elliott. Travis is an internationally known yoga instructor, meditation teacher, musician, author, and entrepreneur. He is the creator of the DVD series, The Ultimate Yogi, co-creator of the digital series, Yoga 30 for 30, along with many other best-selling yoga DVDs. He is also the CEO of Inner Domain Media, which is best described as the Netflix of yoga. Travis is my favorite yoga teacher. I practice with him whenever I can. Today, Travis shares his incredible story about his journey to where he is. His search for spiritual fulfillment holds truths and lessons for us all on how to use one's influence for good. To tell you more wouldn't do it justice. So let's get right to it. I'm joined today by Travis Elliott. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be on. You are a yoga instructor? Yes, I am. A meditation teacher? Yes, I am. We're going to do the litany of things that you are. (laughs) It's going to take a minute. (laughs) Author? Yes. Recently a podcast host? Yeah. Uh, Entrepreneur, and we'll go through the many uh, available offerings. Um, Now, many of my influencer clients do yoga, but you're my first... Yogi, that's been uh, an influencer. Cool, well, so an honor to be on. So yeah, um, and you have embraced all things digital. You are you've been on YouTube for over ten years. I did some homework. I didn't even know that. You it's been over ten years. Over ten years. It's amazing. Uh, you're on Instagram, and I'll ask you about that. You've been on Twitter since 2011. Now. Do you get any, you know, the yoga community is always, at least my, until I started doing yoga, it was, oh, you, you eat granola and, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know the, the old stereotypes. The granola hippies yeah, with dreadlocks, exactly, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not, but, but that was my stereotype. Do you get pushback from the yoga community about your digital promotion? I don't, you know, I, I at least not to my face, you know, I, I think that you know, we're in a day and age now where people are are basically hip to making peace with spirituality and business, which I like to call being a spiritual preneur instead of an <laughs> entrepreneur, that, that that's actually a, a really, really good thing. And then if you don't market yourself and you don't embrace the business and you don't make peace with the, the, the abundance and the money aspect of things... It's actually a very selfish thing because you're not able to get your message out. If you're not able to pay your bills, if you're not able to go out and make future projects because your business is bad, then you're not getting your message out. Therefore, you're not serving people. You're not helping people. And for me, you know, there's things that I have in my life, like teaching inside prison. That Which we'll talk about. So I want great. to ask you about that. You know, I I wouldn't be able to go do those things. I wouldn't be able to get on a plane and fly all the way to the state of Maine on my own dime if I wasn't making money in these other sectors of my business. So I think in in, in many ways, uh, uh, people people now are are cool with it. Well, good. I mean, I'm glad because it gets the message out. Yeah. Um, Now, to put where you are today in context, I want to take you back to the start. Okay. You are from... Originally from where? I was born in a a little town outside Houston, Texas. And at the age of two, my my parents, who were computer and math whizzes, got a contract through NASA in Holland. So at the age of two, I I then moved to Holland for about a year. And uh, after being in Holland, we came back to Houston. And then at around the age of five, I moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is where I really grew up. And then uh, your mom introduced you to meditation when you were nine? She did. She did at the age of nine. So a lot How of did things, that happen? Well, I, you know, I don't know. 
I don't I don't know how it really happened. All I know is is my kind of general recollection of the, of that of those times. And as we know, our our, our memory, even thinking about what happened last week, is <laughs> is always not so accurate. But the way that I I remember the thing that I do know that happened that was significant in my life at that age was that's when my parents got divorced. And uh, I don't know if she started giving me these meditation tapes related to that. I should actually ask her. But I do know that both my parents were uh, very spiritual. In addition to being these math geniuses, my dad loved Buddhism in college. And my mom was very open to spirituality, never religious. And for whatever reason, she introduced me to, to meditation. And back then, you know, you didn't have... Uh, DVDs and CDs and digital use? stuff. You had cassette tapes. Which, for the listeners, explain what a cassette tape is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a cassette tape is is one of these plastic pieces of tape with two holes in it that look like two eyes, and you stick it into this stereo, and it starts winding the tape around. And if you want to fast forward or rewind it, it's like a process, right. you know. So it, it plays, I think, 60 minutes on one side, and when that finishes, you can flip, flip it over it. and play it on the other side. So this was this was the technology when I was, you know, nine years old. And then, did you, have you been a solid meditator since then? No, not not in the traditional aspect. You know, from the age of nine until about the age of 15, I was steady with meditation. But when I got to the age of 15, like many 15-year-olds, the last thing that I wanted to do was to <laughs> meditate or to do anything spiritual. I wanted to explore the, the world of, of girls and partying and alcohol and all those things. And so from the age of 15 until the age of 26, I didn't meditate. And it wasn't until at the age of 26 that I went to my first yoga class. And then that's when I came back. And I'll talk to you about that, too. Um just kind of a digression, but from your perspective now, as somebody who teaches meditation, what are the prime benefits of meditation? The prime benefits of meditation now are prolific. It's like every other month, it's almost like you see mindfulness and meditation on the front cover of Time Magazine or some major publication. And that's why we now live in exciting times where the science is affirming what these yogis and what these spiritual teachers have been talking about for thousands of years. So those are now converging. So what the science is now showing is a multiple of things. One, you increase more gray matter in areas of the brain that are associated with benevolent states such as happiness and joy, non-reactivity, yes. bliss and peacefulness. And you actually shrink gray matter in areas of the brain that are associated with stress and malevolent states of mind. Uh, we also know from, from meditation that you're, we, we drop the stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. And this is, a, this is a big deal because a lot of science is coming out showing that a lot of the major uh, illnesses and killers like high blood pressure, cancer, stroke what not is associated to the body being in a constant state of stress or what we call sympathetic activity. So we have the sympathetic branch and then we have the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system. Sympathetic is fight, flight, freeze. Parasympathetic is rest, restore, repair, and, and grow. So if we're always in that constant state of stress, then this is breaking down our tissues, our organs, and our cells, which leads to de deterioration and inevitably into illness. So, if if you were if someone were to listen to your podcast, that would be one way to start meditation. But let's say they live in a cave and don't have access to your podcast. How would somebody start? What's the best way to start with meditation? Well, you know, it depends on the person. It depends on where they're from because you know you may have a born again Christian in the state of. I don't know, Texas <laughs> or uh, somewhere in the South. And the meditation technique that's going to work for them is different than somebody who, you know, maybe lives in a, in a more liberal or progressive area or another country. So, or Santa Monica. Or Santa Monica, exactly. It also depends on what the person's personality type is. If somebody's very type A personality, go, 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 you know, they have a lot of ambition, a lot of drive. 
I'm going to give them a different technique than somebody who's already naturally more, more, you know, maybe at peace right. and settled. So, for example, let's take the context of somebody who's very devoutly religious and maybe has resistance to meditation. I would have them uh, pick a, a, a word that they can resonate with. And it doesn't have to be a Sanskrit word. It doesn't have to be a, a word in a foreign language. It can be in the English language, and that word could be love, compassion, peace, ease, bliss, whatever it is, and then just have them silently repeat that word for two to five minutes. And in between the repetition of the word, there's a gap of space. There's a gap of stillness. And that stillness is where all the magic begins to happen because we begin to move beyond this realm of thoughts and thinking into a, a dimension of ourselves that's beyond all that. So now we create distance and space between us and the word or the thought. And as Viktor Frankl, the 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 gentleman that survived the you know the Nazi, Auschwitz, yeah, yeah, and, and and man's search for meaning, he talks about our freedom as human beings is all about that space between the stimulus and then how we respond. But most people, they don't respond, they react because there's no space there. So the space between the repetition of words is really the key. So we're going to, from meditation to acting. When you were in high school, what did you want to do when you grew up? So the other significant thing that happened at the age of nine was this is when I started getting into acting and into theater. And I've always been very fascinated by human behavior. And so at the age of nine, I would love to study other people. And I would love in, in plays and in movies, you know, just the history and the context that these stories would take place. So I think more than anything, I've always been very fascinated by storytelling, whether that was done through a book, a play, or a movie. So at the age of nine, my, my mom, again, she, she just put me into some theater program and I fell in love with it. And I think for me, the, the biggest reason that I fell in love with it was because at that time I was going through this, this paradigm shift of my mom and my dad divorcing and breaking up and being with other kids and being on a team, so to speak. Right. It wasn't a sports team, but it was a different kind of a creative team. I think was very, very healing for me. And when we eventually, after doing the rehearsals and we went on stage, it was an experience unlike anything that, that I had ever gotten to uh, really taste. That adrenaline rush of a live performance. Exactly, yeah. And the, 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 the rush of stepping beyond your comfort zone. You know, I, I think uh, I think especially at that age, I was more of an introvert. Like here, I was meditating. You know, right. I'm a nine year like what nine year old kid is <laughs> from North Carolina? In North Carolina, is going inside and meditating like that's crazy. And uh, this brought me out of my shell a little bit, and I think that helped me find quite a bit of balance. And then you're off to college to study acting. Yeah. And, you know, in high school, I worked at three TV stations. So not only was I an actor, but I was also very much into all aspects of filmmaking, whether that was cinematography or directing or producing. So I worked at three TV stations. I worked at a local news station. I worked at a public access station and I worked at the local school station. And I did everything. I did. I, I would do cameras. I would do lighting. I would do editing. I learned all of that. And I remember being in certain classes in, in school and the teachers teaching whatever the subject is. And I'm like drawing out on this piece of paper, like this whole scene and where I would put the lights and where I put the camera and the dolly track and where the actors would go. Like I just was so fired up about that. So at the end of high school, I had to make this decision. Am I going to be behind the camera or am I going to be in front of the camera? And it wasn't an easy decision, but I decided to go in front of the camera. And uh, that led me to uh, an amazing acting program at East Carolina University, where I, I, I majored in, in acting there. And I uh, either heard or read that you got a call from a casting director 
after you had graduated, right after you graduated, uh, George Lucas's casting director. Tell yeah, that was that. Uh, that was senior year in college. And this was at the time when they were casting, uh, I can't remember which episode it is because there's so many of them, but they were looking for the young Anakin Skywalker. And at that time, I was, I was already a professional actor. North Carolina was producing behind California and New York the most amount of uh, film and television uh, in the business. So I was able to you know, start working, doing commercials, industrials, TV, whatnot. And yeah, I got a call from my agent. They said, uh, I forget what her name was, but they were looking, you know, for an Anakin Skywalker. And I was just so (laughs) excited that they were, you know, here I was as kid in North Carolina about to graduate and they were, Hollywood was calling. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually you did go to Hollywood. I did. You worked on a movie first, got some money, uh, and then you moved out. Yeah, I worked uh, right after I graduated uh, college. I worked on a movie called Domestic Disturbance with John Travolta, Vince Vaughn, and Steve Buscemi. And uh, I was a teamster on that movie. So I was in the union. I made a lot of money. I was 22 years old. And, making and union wages. Making union wages. Got the full benefits, whatnot. And so after that that movie had wrapped, a couple months after that, me and two two buddies of mine, we uh, loaded everything up in, in the back of a U-Haul trailer and uh, attached it to my buddy's uh, Suburban. And we drove all the way straight to West Hollywood, right off the Sunset Strip near the Whiskey Go-Go, the Viper Room. And we, we had a, a new home there. How long did it take you to get adjusted to L.A.? It took a long time. I mean, I, I think I, I actually never felt like I really got adjusted till I found yoga two years after being in L.A. The first two years was it was crazy. You know, a lot of partying, uh, drugs, girls. Uh, eventually, I spent all my money going to casting, got a job at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel it was just all over the place, but still at that time, I was, I was, I was, I was not going to give up on 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 being an actor. Like I, whatever it took, I was going to you know make that happen. Then how did yoga enter your life? So when I was working at the Ritz Carlton, I, I did a few different jobs there, and at, at one point I was working in the banquets department. And there was this other guy named Brandon who who kept talking about this yoga class he was going to. And I like Brandon. He was an older guy and he kind of took me under under his wing a little bit at the in the department. He just had a good energy and a good vibe. One of those people that doesn't have to say a lot, but you can just feel like a, a good vibe. And he always talked about going to yoga, but I had this weird stigma as to what granola. yoga was, yeah, very <laughs> well, yeah, and not even the granola thing, but really just to me, yoga was about bending your body into a pretzel, and uh, and and I imagine that your teacher would would kind of look a little bit like Moses, you know, <laughs> with a big beard, possibly a turban. <laughs> You know, they're like 80 years old. Yeah, man buns are cool now. But back then, you know, they they weren't a novelty. But um, so, yeah, I had a lot of resistance to it. But he just kept bringing it up and bringing it up. And he had this good energy. And eventually I, I let him drag me to a class. And you liked it. It was more than like it was it was it was it was love. You know, it was it was love at first sight. And it really, more than anything, it brought me back to who I was at nine years old. So it brought me back to this this kid that was meditating and this kid that was inherently good and pure and had the whole world in front of him. All things were possible. Nothing could stop him. And this kid that went on a journey, you know, as, as many of us do, and sometimes the journey takes us through what Joseph Campbell calls the dark night of the soul, you know, where you move through suffering and you make bad decisions and you live with the, the karma of that. And now I came back to this, this kid. So it felt really like a homecoming. And I knew that that was where I was meant to be. That's where I, I, I belonged and that that's what I wanted to start putting all my energy into. Right from that first class, it was like, I just want to come back here. From that first class, how often did you go then? 
I was going, uh, you know, as, as, as much as I could, which was probably four to five times a week because I still had my job at, at the Ritz Carlton. I lived up in West Hollywood. So getting from West Hollywood to downtown Santa Monica was a little bit of a trek. So, I, yeah, it was like four or five times a week. And then I read where you, within four months, were going to a yoga retreat. Yeah. And the, the funny thing is, is at that point, I'd spent all my money. So I was living paycheck to paycheck. And I couldn't afford the retreat. But there was something inside of me that said, Travis, you got to be there. Whatever it takes, get your ass to, to Hawaii. Retreat. Get your ass to that <laughs> retreat. So... I, I, I got a credit card. I, I signed up for a credit card, you know, had a balance of like, you know, two, three thousand dollars on it. And the retreat cost like, you know, a thousand. And then I bought my airfare. So I basically maxed out the credit card just so I could get to that retreat. Did something special happen at the retreat? Something very, very... I don't know that special is the right word. but It was special. It's, yeah. it's actually, you know, I think it's actually the, the perfect word. The first day on the retreat, uh, we went on a massive hike along the Nepali coast, a whole group of us. And eventually, after hiking a couple of hours, we, we dipped down into this remote cove in the middle of nowhere. And along the, the, the trail, you know, are all these signs about not going into the ocean because uh, the, the currents and the rip tide was so strong that, you know, people would drown, people would die. And uh, as soon as I got to the beach and I just saw how beautiful the ocean was and it was just, you know, when you think about tropical paradise, this was this was it. And I'd grown up as a lifeguard. Uh, I was a surfer. I was a, a, a pretty good swimmer, not competitive, but pretty good. So I didn't listen to the signs and I, I went out into the water and uh, it ended up being a massive mistake. And I had, a, you know, a, a, a really big battle and a bit, big fight for my life. I, I had a near death, near drowning experience. And, uh, and not only did I, was I drowning, but I also got thrown up against these, these rocks on the edge of the cove over and over again. And I got my, my whole body got bloodied and, and, and bashed up and, 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 you know, my face was, was bleeding and I blacked out because it was so intense. And as I was drifting out to sea, I remember very distinctly uh, not questioning that I was uh, going to die. It was all right. It's not a question of if; it's how yeah. now. And in that moment, I had like a, you know, almost like a scene out of a movie where uh, uh, just a fast replay of all the major highlights of my life. And I remember distinctly uh, not thinking about my stuff. Like I didn't think about money in the bank account, didn't think about my house, didn't think about my clothes, didn't think about all this stuff that we're, we're so obsessed with in this culture. That did not cross my mind. What crossed my mind was all the people that had loved me and all the people that I had loved and that I wouldn't get to say goodbye to. So there I was, uh, ready to take my last breath. And as I did, and I started to sink underneath the water, this arm out of nowhere just reached around and grabbed me. And uh, it ended up being this, this other guy from the retreat who was a lifeguard up in San Francisco and was a very strong swimmer. And he was waiting for me to uh, get dragged away from the rocks so that he could rescue me. And if it hadn't have been for him being there, I would have drowned that day. So uh, he saved my life. Eventually, he was able to get both of us back to safety on the beach. And again, walking back on this, this trail on the Nepali coast, it was the little things that we never acknowledged, like the light coming through the canopy of the, of the, of the trees, and then the wind blowing across your face. And people smiling and connecting and talking, all these things that we, we take for granted, I remember they were so significant on that walk back home. It seems I almost tried to tri do a transition now, but I'm going <laughs> to transition. So when you got back, you started teaching. But 
you did it without teacher training. You just started teaching. How did you do that? So after I got back from Kauai, uh, the way that it, it kind of went down was I still had one foot in this old paradigm of, you know, I had this vision of, of making it in the entertainment business, but now I had this foot in this new paradigm, this new path. And I was in no man's land for about a year. And then a year after that, I went on another retreat, this time to Thailand. And uh, I was a student on the retreat, same teacher, actually, Govindas. And at the end of that retreat, uh, this woman that he did the retreat with that lived there, she invited me to stick around and start teaching yoga. And I had never planned to be a teacher it wasn't something that, that I'd ever really considered. But I did know that I loved yoga. I was passionate about it. There was, there was uh, a voice inside of me that, that felt like this is what really matters. And part of that had to do with the near-death experience in Kauai. So I, I said yes. You know, I, I, I was really scared. I hadn't done a teacher training but I said yes. And, uh, you know, the first class that I taught, I just taught from my passion of yoga. It was probably one of the worst classes that's ever been taught in history. I, remember, I doubt that. I've taken some bad classes. Well, this was pretty bad. You know, I didn't have the sequencing and, you know, I had people in poses for way longer than they should be in the right. pose. But, you know, they, they, they felt the passion and, uh, and I think, you know, that, that says a lot, you know, if somebody's passionate and they, they embody it, they feel it, then, you know, you can look past, you know, the things that are trainable about somebody. And then about two weeks after I started teaching yoga, yoga there, the tsunami of 2004 hit this island that we were at, this island called Kolanta. So I had another near-death experience. I, at one point, I was in my beachfront bungalow, surrounded by the ocean, not sure how what to do. Right. And uh, luckily, it, you know, the water receded. And when the water receded, I was able to escape out of my bungalow and get to this little hill. And then I watched the, the tidal waves come in and demolish my whole resort. So I always say in Kauai, the big lesson that I learned was love what matters. Don't, you know, it's okay to have a nice car and a nice house. All that stuff is fine, but don't let it possess you. Possess it. Those are your possessions. What really matters is what do you, what do you, what do you bring into your relationships? What's your legacy in the world? How are you, what do you bring in? What's your gift that you're giving humanity? That's what I mean when I say love what matters. And then the second big lesson that I learned from the tsunami was all things are impermanent. Here I was, another tropical paradise, and I just assumed that this would be permanent. This, all this would always be there. But we know, we know from the California wildfires that, that come through, you know, these houses just go in a split second. We know that, that we, we have a loved one and in an instant they have a heart attack and they're, and, and they're gone, you know, and our breath comes and goes and, and the seasons come and go. Everything, even our cells, you know, in, in just a few seconds, 50,000 cells in your body disappear and 50,000 cells are created. And it's one thing to read about that in a book or to hear it on this podcast right. But to, ex- to live it. but to live it and to experience it as, as I did viscerally, like literally saw a tidal wave come in and demolish the entire restaurant right in front of my eyes, you know, that was the, the, the next big teaching. So that's how I started teaching yoga. And because the tsunami came, I was forced to go back home to Los Angeles and uh, otherwise, I may still be in Thailand right now. <laughs> so, how much? How much is a class, a yoga class, like a production? I mean, there's the sequencing, and so much of it's. Well, I'll let you answer that, and then I have a follow up to it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny that you asked that because you know, uh, you know, maybe we'll talk about this more. But now, you know, I I, I film a, a lot of we'll, yoga we'll talk, video we'll programs, yeah. so that's that is a production. But as far as like the live experience goes, there's a lot of parallels to, to, to filmmaking. 
to me, especially the style of yoga that I teach, which is power yoga, sometimes known as vinyasa yoga, and I also teach a style of yoga called yin yoga. But power yoga or flow yoga, vinyasa yoga is like music. So there's cadence and there's a rhythm to it. And the way that, that I've always been inspired to teach, although the alignment points are there and it's very important to guide people through sequences that are safe and smart, I like to bring in that element of storytelling. So, uh, you know, I'll bring in a story, you know. And, and it's uh, always when you're in down dog and it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it is. I, you know, over especially back in the day, I used yeah. to do that. But over the years, I've learned to place the long <laughs> stories in the poses that don't hurt as much. You know, like a, yeah. a, a stretch on the floor because I find people are more receptive to it. So when you mix the storytelling component and you mix the rhythm component and you mix... You know, as a teacher, you're using your voice. You know, a lot of what I learned as an actor made me feel comfortable being in front of like a group of people. Now I'll go in front of, it doesn't matter how many people it is, I'm comfortable in front of people. And so there's there's a lot of similarities there. Total shift. Um, the Instagram, your Instagram account. Uh, early on, the insta- and the lights just went out in here. <laughs> Uh, early on, uh, your posts are all personal. And then about three years ago, there was a transition from business to slash yoga. How much of that was intentional and how much of that was just that's what was going on in your life? Well, I think, you know, we're always evolving and these, these, these platforms are also always evolving and you're always exploring so I think at the beginning it was it was you know first of all I was very late to the game. I'm usually the last one to show up at the at the the social media party, you know. <laughs> so I was like one of the last ones to get on Facebook, one of the last ones to get on Instagram because there's part of me that that really just likes simple things. And you know you start stacking up Twitter, social, uh, Instagram, Facebook, whatnot, YouTube, and you know it, it gets a lot to start managing. And so anyways, at the beginning of Instagram, yeah, it was all personal. And then as, as you know, you go along, you start to realize that you can use this platform to, you know, also help promote your, your, your business. And so, you know, now I'm at a place where it's both personal and also business and just little things like, you know, I'm trying to now alternate between an image that's just an image and then an image that's like a quote card, you know, so you go back and forth between the two. So I'm always exploring, but it's hard, you know, it's hard to find the rhythm and, you know, it's always, it's a work in progress. How much of this do you sequence in advance versus you're struck by the moment? It's, you know, I don't sequence it in advance. I, 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 I know generally that I, I want to be on a rhythm where I'm posting twice a day. So an image and then maybe one quote a day on Instagram. And I would like to do a little bit more than that on Facebook. You know, I'd like to do three or four times on, on Facebook, but it gets to be a lot. So I, I don't have things, you know, organized where it's all rolling out and automatically like some people do through certain uh, programs it's more of an organic approach. And then you had mentioned it earlier, but you've done a number of DVDs. And in preparing, I think I found your first DVD. It was a single one-off DVD of you teaching a class. I also found another one of Brian Kest, where he looked like Gene Simmons. <laughs> <It was> the- <laughs> or Bon Jovi with <laughs> yeah. the, the, the Gene the pants. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but the you, you then... Uh, came out with a DVD series, The Ultimate Yogi. How did that come about? The Ultimate Yogi came about from a, a student of mine uh, at, at a yoga studio. And the way that relationship started was he had a, a house up in the Malibu Canyon. And he wanted, it was, a, it was a bad time in the real estate market. The real estate market was plummeting, so he couldn't sell the house. He had built his house and he wanted to sell it. And because he couldn't do that, he was looking to turn it into a, a yoga retreat center. So he asked me if I would help him do that. So I went out, checked it out, and uh, beautiful house, saltwater pool, 
and he built a yoga studio yurt overlooking the mountains. So we turned it into a retreat center, which ended up doing very well. And one day at the end of a, of a retreat, uh, he said, what's next? And I looked at him and I said, you know, there's this program called P90X that's huge right Tony now. Tony Horton. Tony Horton. <laughs> And, you know, it was all the rage. It was like, it was an exercise program with a, with a really... I still do p 90 Do you? Yeah. yeah. So, you know... It's a great workout. It's a great workout. It works. You get results. Tony Horton's engaging. He's funny. He's passionate. And the way they shot it, you know, was different. It wasn't cheesy. Right. It was cool. And I think it, it really struck a chord with a lot of people. And so I said, you know, nobody's done the yoga version of P90X. And he goes on to tell me that his dad's a big movie producer, a guy named Avi Lerner. And uh, he would talk to his dad and see if if he would be open to, uh, you know, I, re- I represent Avi. Do you? <laughs> there you go. So, you know. <laughs> so, I. Uh, he uh, he talked to Avi, and uh, Avi said yes. So Yariv calls me out, the, his son Yariv, and he calls me out the next day, and he says, uh, my dad said it's cool. He said the only question is we have to decide whether we want to film it in Louisiana where he has a studio or in Bulgaria where he has a, a studio. <laughs> and I said, well, I've been to New Orleans, but I haven't been to Bulgaria. Let's do it in Bulgaria. And he said, Done. So uh, that's how we ended up in Bulgaria, and it happened really fast. It's all happened within the span of six months. So six months later, me and 20 of my favorite students were in Bulgaria on a Hollywood backlot with amazing uh, gear and equipment, and we filmed the Ultimate Yogi 108-day program in about a week. How did it do? It's done really well. You know, uh, a lot of people say it's the most successful yoga program of all time. And then just like Tony Horton, who came out with a 30-minute version of P90X, uh, you came out with 30 for 30. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, you know, the the funny thing is, is that all this stuff happened because students asked me to create them. So even in the beginning, the very first DVD I did I would started to travel because I was getting invited to go teach other studios and other places. And people said, Travis, will you put together a DVD so we can practice while you're gone? And, uh, and so Yoga 30 for 30 really happened because people said, you know, the ultimate yogi is too long. It's 60 minutes. It's 70 minutes. I wish you had a 30-minute version. So because of that, we went out and uh, Yoga 30 for 30 was what was something I'm very proud of because Ultimate Yogi was done with uh, in coordination with another production company. They were the ones that put forth the investment, so they paid for it. And uh, Yoga 30 for 30 was a stage in my life and my career where I had learned that if you really want to be successful, you got to be the one that's the investor and you got to be the one that's the owner, that the investors and the owners, you you have the risk, right? right. So if, if it doesn't do well, it's on you. But if it does well, the then upside, it's yours you too. get the upside. And Yoga 30 for 30 uh, was financed by myself and, and my, my wife, uh, Lauren. And, and, you know, to be candid, it was actually her money <laughs> that, uh, that she, she really put into it. So I got to give her, you know, the gratitude and, and the shout out for that. And we invested, you know, it was a good chunk of change, you know, I think sixty seventy thousand dollars $70,000 into that, that project. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget the the first day we released it was right before uh, Christmas. You know, and uh, we sold like like five hundred uh, units in in the first day, and it was a hundred dollars a pop. Yeah. So we made we almost made our investment back in one day. And the significant thing also about Yoga Thirty for Thirty was we were on the verge of making this a DVD program. Because this was this was a few years ago. People were still download, using DVDs, yeah. but we hadn't really reached critical mass yet. And we decided, you know what, the wave of the future is digital. You know, I know people out there still love their their DVDs and 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 whatever. But the wave of the future, we're moving in this direction. So we rolled the dice and said, let's go all digital. 
So it was amazing when we sold those 500 units, we didn't have to go and press the DVDs and press the DVDs or package it, stick it into, you know, a box and mail it out. It was all instant. And uh, people loved it. It was a huge hit right away. And it's still still available. Still doing, still still available, available, still doing very well. And you have now followed up with yet another program. Yeah, it just Uh, came out. Flexibility and Beyond. Yeah, Flexibility Beyond. So Flexibility Beyond is a a, a yin yoga program. And if you're unfamiliar, yin yoga is like the fountain of youth. It's where you hold deep stretches, typically on the floor. It's different than a power yoga class. It's really the opposite of that. And the benefits of it is that it's really good for your joints, your connective tissues, your fascia, And uh, it keeps the body young and supple. And I think Bruce Lee said it best when he said, um, you know, that if you if you really want to be if you really want to be your best, you want to be more like bamboo or willow because bamboo or willow survives by bending with the wind as opposed to a, a tree that's all strength, no flexibility and just gets snapped into two. Now, if you were to do both, the power yoga and the yin yoga, how would you mix it up? Well, one thing that you could do, I mean, it depends on how much time you have. If you have time to just do one yoga practice a day, you could do power yoga one day, yin yoga the next day, power yoga the next day, and just Just go. Just alternate. Just alternate. Or if you have more time, you could do a power yoga class in the morning, and then you could do the yin yoga in the evening. Because the yin yoga, I was talking earlier in the podcast about the importance of the parasympathetic nervous system yin yoga along with meditation is one of those things that helps us to switch out of the stress response into the parasympathetic response so what happens is you're you do your yin yoga at night you decrease your stress and then you go to sleep and your sleep is much better you're getting deeper quality sleep and then you're waking up the next day, you feel better, you, you more feel rested, you got more energy, <laughs> and you got, yeah, you have more energy to go do what you want to do in your day. Um, you are also an author. You've done two books, one on holistic yoga and another on yin yoga. Uh, you're a musician. You had a chant album, The Meaning of Soul. What, what instruments do you play? I play guitar. And I, I sing a little bit, and then I play an instrument called the harmonium, which is uh, it's like an acoustic uh, organ from, from India. And then your uh, one of your latest ventures is your podcast, the Be Ultimate Podcast, which I highly recommend. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, how did that come about? How did you decide to do a podcast? Well, I was I was looking for a way to expand my reach. And I found this 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 gentleman by the name of Brendan Burchard. And Brendan Burchard is a a uh, kind of like a mo- he's like a young Tony Robbins motivational coach speaker, but he also he has a lot of programs on how to how to go step by step of 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 really uh, expanding your reach, expanding your brand and your business. And one of the things that he he taught me in, in his online course was to record a video of yourself doing a talk. So whatever your expertise is, you know, you you record that. So obviously, my expertise is yoga, meditation, and personal growth. But at the same time that you record the video, you also have the audio and you can extrapolate the audio and release the audio as the podcast in addition to releasing the video on on platforms like YouTube and your blog. So initially I got into it because of the video component and then the podcast was just connected to that. And uh and, you know, we launched it a few months ago and it's been a, it's been a really, you know, I'm not making any money off of it right now, but I, it's, it's kind of a, a labor of love. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it 
And the, what feels good is that people are really benefiting from, from the, the podcasts and the episodes. You know, we release meditations and talks on. That's what I said earlier. If you're not listening to the podcast, there are meditations that you can listen to. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's reaching a lot of people. You know, the, the podcast uh, medium, as you know, is a powerful medium. And, if it, it, you know, even though it's not the best business decision at this point, maybe down the road it will be, it, it feels good to be releasing stuff that's helping people. And then, uh, not lastly, but, but again, a new venture is you have Interdimension TV. Uh, described by by some as the Netflix of yoga. What is that? Interdimension TV is a, a monthly subscription service that we launched about uh, a year ago. And it has yoga classes, it has meditation classes, and we're about to release a new category all on daily living, personal growth. How do you take this stuff into your life, off of your yoga mat, off your meditation cushion? And, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, stream for as little as nine ninety five a month and you get access to a whole library of high quality yoga. So everything we do is, is we, you know, being a filmmaker, we, we have fun, you know, where we shoot these classes typically with three cameras. So a very high production value and looks good, feels good. And, um, uh, this is really the, the the platform that I'm most passionate about right now and something that, you know, we're going to create an app for later this year. We're actually doing a revamp of the website, making it even better. We're filming more programs uh, this, this year. Flexibility and Beyond is actually going to be released uh, to stream uh, June 12th. And this is where, you know, I'm going to make content and I'm going to put it out through this platform to share with, with the world. Now, you teased it earlier, but you have taught yoga in a maximum security prison. How did you even, did somebody invite you? Yeah, the way that that, that went down was I, I was teaching out a studio in, in Maine, the state of Maine. And there was this organization. And someone said, hey, you should come to the prison. <laughs> yeah, there was this, this, this amazing organization called the Liberation Institute. And they teach uh, uh, a yoga teacher training inside the, the state prison, a maximum security prison there. And they knew that we were, you know, already coming to Maine. And so they said, after you teach your workshop, would you come, you know, come down and, and teach in, in, in the prison? So we got the invitation and, uh, and the first I've, I've been there three times now in a, in, in a year and the first time we went there, we taught two days straight. We taught eight hours on the first day and then nine hours on the second day. Teacher training or just yoga? We, it was all, it was all yoga. And on that, you know, we, every time we go, we do a different subject. So the first visit, we focused on our methodology, which we call holistic yoga flow. And that provides kind of the context to, to everything that we do. And uh, so we would start the day, you know, with a class about an hour and a half long, and then we would go into lectures throughout the rest of the day, and then we would finish with a, a meditation at the very end of the day. How was that the first time you walked into prison, just being in that atmosphere? It was terrifying. <laughs> you no, know? I've, I've been, I've, I've, for, for cases, I've had to be there. And it's, yeah. It is, it's... Yeah, you know, anytime you go into an environment that uh, is new, and you've seen on, you know, on, on TV, you know, uh, you hear a lot about it, you see it in movies, it's, it's, it brings up a lot of stuff. And so on the way, we had to drive like almost two hours to, to go to the prison and the whole way there, like my insides are shaking and churning. <laughs> and uh, eventually we got to the prison and I, I remember walking into the lobby of the prison and the warden was standing there to greet me and I didn't know he was the warden but he just goes Travis Elliott <laughs> and I was like how does this guy in the middle of Maine know no, who I am in, in this prison <laughs> and I didn't know this before we got invited but what I later learned was that the inmates had been doing my yoga videos that they, they had been doing the ultimate yogi program so they were primed so they were primed 
And he told me, he said, the guys are so excited for you. They're all (laughs) revved up for you. And that made me even more nervous. And I didn't know what to expect. You know, we, we went through security. We go through door after door after door. Then they hand us these, these man down buttons, which is like a, uh, like the size of a, like a pager or a tape measure box with a big red button on it. And in an emergency, you can press that and they come and rescue you out of a dangerous situation. And then eventually I went, I was led into this room a lot. My wife, Lauren was, was with me and we got led into this, this big open room. And I remember walking into the room and I had like 20 plus inmates just all beelining it straight at me. <laughs> because I think in my head, I expected them to like be behind a, a, yeah. or, or just to be behind a protective barrier yeah, or to have handcuffs. Like I didn't, you know, it was like the first time I went to yoga, like what I thought I was going to be ended up being different. Prison was the same thing. And so I, I got quickly surrounded by these 20 guys and uh, initially My stress response was like, you know, in red (laughs) alert mode. But very, very quickly, I saw the biggest smiles on these guys' faces. And I also saw tears in their eyes. And one by one, they were giving me gratitude and introducing themselves. And whatever apprehension that I had quickly eroded. And I was like, this is about to be the most rewarding experience in my career um and it it ended up being that way now you've been back twice more twice more yeah i was just there actually uh a few weeks ago and uh and so now we have a you know we have a relationship with these guys and a lot of them send us letters and we write them back and now we have a whole whole rapport and it's it's beautiful because the yoga is in there in the prison and it's saving their lives some of these guys are suicidal. They're trying to, you know, slice their throat with razor blades and they're thrown in solitary confinement and they have the yoga on the uh, behind this bulletproof glass on the wall of their cell and they get led to the yoga and then it changes their lives. Cuz a lot of these men, uh, you know, they've grown up in an environment that was violent and abusive. Their parents were on drugs, they were adopted. And uh, they don't, they didn't know, they didn't know that there was another way of living. They didn't know that there were, there was messaging out there that you could put inside your head that was benevolent instead of malevolent. And now, as the warden describes it, this, this, this yoga has really sent a a ripple throughout the whole population of the whole thousand men. I would think it's calmed them down a lot. It's helped out tremendously, and now they're not offending uh, when they get let out. They're, so they're not reoffending and coming back to prison. The warden said, you know, it costs forty thousand dollars a year per inmate to, you know, in the state of Maine to house these guys. So they know it's not sustainable to keep throwing people into prison. And anything that can break the cycle, whether it's it's yoga or meditation or hospice care, whatever it is. They're starting to allocate resources towards those programs so that they can break the cycle and really rehabilitate these men. So one guy was the the most misbehaved inmate in the whole prison. This guy with war tattooed across his throat, the A's and anarchy sign. And he, through the yoga, went from being the worst inmate in the prison, stabbing people, dealing drugs, suicidal, to now being the best inmate in the prison. And now he's teaching yoga to other people all because he got access to the ultimate yogi. And then when the Liberation Institute came in there and they said, we're going to start reaching out to other uh, yoga teachers to come in to come see you guys. Who would you want? Well, they naturally wanted the guy that they had been doing the yoga with, Travis Elliott. And they didn't think that they would get me there. But as fate would have it, it the stars were were aligned. And then I, I ended up going there. So we're kind of on the downhill side of this interview. I want to ask you a couple personal questions. Not that these others haven't been personal, but what's your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure right now is caffeine. You know, I, it, it used to be alcohol <laughs> <laughs> and girls. And, uh, you know, then it, it shifted to cigarettes and drugs. 
and then it was sugar and you know just over the years I've 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 refined and refined and refined and now it's it's been caffeine. Caffeine isn't the worst thing for you. It's not, you know, it's 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 not, but I have an addictive personality and so my problem is is that you know, it's it's not just one serving of caffeine. It can quickly turn into a hundred <laughs> servings. <laughs> what is the one piece of entertainment that you wish you could erase from your mind so you could experience it again for the first time? That's a great question. Great question. You know, I think about some of the 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 amazing movies that just just rocked my world. And uh, I, th- I think about uh, a movie like Legends of the Fall, and for whatever reason, that that movie just it uh, it just really captured a soul and an essence for me. Another movie around that same time was Last of the Mohicans. So I've been drawn, you know, even back in the day with with the filmmaking, I've always been drawn to stories that have a have a, a message that's correlated to spirit and soul and stuff beyond just our limitations of physicality. And you know, if I could go back and, and watch either of those movies for the, the first, first time, time, that would be uh, that would be amazing. Have you ever been starstruck by one of your students? I, I, I have been starstruck, uh, you know, nowadays because of the, the, the digital, uh, medium, you know, I, I hear about some of these celebrities that, that do my yoga videos that, uh, I don't get to meet, unfortunately, <laughs> but I, I find out through their trainers or whatever that they're doing it. But, uh, you know, I, I remember, uh, I remember having Hillary Swank in a, in a, in a yoga class and also, like, I'm, I, I question whether it's really the celebrity or not. Right. You know, I'm not, I'm not even sure if it's, it's them. But, uh, and then another one was Rick Fox, who at that time was playing for the Lakers. Los Angeles Lakers. You know, I, I, I really have a lot of reverence and respect for many of the, the athletes out there. And so Rick Fox, you know, being six foot six and also, you know, being a guy and being pretty graceful in his yoga practice was 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 pretty amazing. Um, do you consider yourself to be an influencer? You know, I it's funny because this this word influencer is 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 got a lot of buzz right now, and of course, uh, you know, the name of, of this podcast has has influencer in it. You know, I think that, uh, you know, to be honest, like I I had a little resistance towards the word influencer because uh, uh, what initially what I thought influencer meant and what it seemed to mean to a lot of people was that you are this big personality on social media and through that you get these brand deals and sponsorships. That is one definition. It's one. Yeah. And what I learned is that that's just a little slice of what it is to be an influencer. And I, I kind of, I, there's colleagues that I know that are yoga influencers that have, you know, thousands, a hundred thousand plus followers on social media platforms but they can't fill a yoga retreat or they they can't sustain a a local yoga class and so I had a little bit of a a a negative perspective on it because to me it was like this illusionary surface level thing that I didn't want to be a part of but as I had to do with the business aspect of what I do and the marketing aspect of what I do, and now what I'm just now learning with the word influencer is to align with it in a different kind of a way that the word influencer is is a tool. And you can use that tool in a very powerful, constructive way, or you can use it in a dark and destructive way. Right. And I would like to be uh, uh, a person that inspires and motivates and influences people to be their best and to want to be their best and to give their best in whatever it is that they do in their life. So last question. Where can people find you on the internet? Travis Elliott. Dot com. And Elliot is one L, one T, just like the poet T.S. Elliot. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. (laughs) 
that's it for this time. If you enjoyed our podcast, please write a review on iTunes and tell your friends to subscribe. If you have any questions about influencers or suggestions for future episodes, email them to john at pfeifferpfeifferlaw.com. Thank you for listening.